Awesome. Okay. And I, I know you'll get a blessing on it, but God, that book will, it, it'll put you uh, in a place of just, um, you, you, you won't be able to put it down. I'll put it like that. All right. So here's some upcoming meetings that we have. The coming of the lawless one. We don't have a drawing tonight, do we? Are you bringing those in? We do. do what are we giving away? We're going to give away that away? All right. Well, let's do it. I got to have another drawing here. How about Jenny, that's my wife, by the way. When she says it, we're going to do it. All right. So these are those that turn in lessons. Oh, so we're going to give, you guys are going to really like this. This is my personal testimony of how I became a Christian. So it's free indeed. But let me tell you, if you win it, you might just want to hold on to it because I'm actually going to be sharing my story live here. If you got the schedule, you look down there. It's right toward the last night on earth. It's going to be my presentation here at the end. This one's called Free Indeed, A Testimony of Miracles and Mercy. So who's going to win it tonight? I tell you what, I do a lot of drawings. I'm going to let you randomly pick one here. So you can find out who's going to win it. Not can't. I only have one. I can't give away two. Okay. It's going to be to Kim Shepard. Well, I, I, you know what? I, I never begrudge when somebody wins twice. She can give it away to anybody else she wants, but uh, she can share it. But I tell you what, I, every time I do a drawing, if somebody wins it, it's like the Lord meant it for that person. So if somebody wins it twice, they just need it twice as more than you, as you, right? So never get disappointed when somebody else wins. Always rejoice with them, right? All right, thank you for that. That was Ty who came up here. Um, the coming of the lawless one. This is this Friday's presentation. Don't miss this Friday. And I, I tell you, this message will shock you. It will revolutionize your faith. I believe this one will actually, um, it's really a foundational message, especially as it relates to last day prophecy. And it's based on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you want to get a head start on that. But we're going to look at that lawless one. What's it all about? Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And then on Saturday, we've got a double blessing. We're going to come early at 5.30. What time are we going to meet on Saturday? 5.30, Revelation's sign of God. And listen, if you don't want to get the mark of the beast, you definitely want to know what the sign of God is. Okay, you got the sign of God, the seal of God, the mark of the beast. These are wonderful symbols that are important symbols of the book of Revelation. You don't want to miss this. Um, but anyway, after this is over, we're going to slide into the fellowship hall down the way there, and we're going to have a little bit of supper, and we're going to come back and study Revelation's forgotten history. Revelation's forgotten history. So this is a two-part series that night. So don't miss Saturday night. And then... On Sunday, I don't think I have the slide up here, our Sunday presentation is called The Time of the End. The Time of the End. And I tell you, I've been working it out. I, I would present this normally as a two-part presentation. But because it's Mother's Day, I feel that I can present it as a one-part presentation and still will be able to provide a dinner, and then we can just go home after that. How's that sound? So we'll have a presentation... We'll have a dinner, and in fact, I understand it's a catered dinner. This is not some light, uh, you know, light, light refreshments. This is a catered meal. Now, I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but I'm looking forward to it nonetheless. We get to sit down, get to know each other a little bit better, and that's going to be Sunday evening, and we get to have a little special Mother's Day celebration there. Uh, and then I believe this is Tuesday, a river runs through it. Uh, it's going to be important to look. We're going to go back to the book of Genesis. We're going to see something, how it connects to the book of Revelation. And, uh, and just we're going to find this, this thread that runs all the way through the Scriptures. And uh, what, what's, how, how is it relevant to our lives today? And then we're going to go and look at one of the hottest topics that people are asking about. Uh, who is this Babylon? What is the beast of Revelation chapter 13? Who is this little horn of Daniel 7? The, 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 the simple question is, who is the Antichrist? The other night, we studied about actually being here during the time when the Antichrist is revealed, as it says, says there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Well, if we are, wouldn't it be imperative for us to identify who the Antichrist is? I think it is. So please plan on coming out next week. Looking and Again, you have to look at your schedule there to notice the exact dates and times. And then we're going to look at Revelation's keys of 
death. And uh, I've actually had several questions already. People ask me, well, what happens to people after they die? What's the afterlife going to be like? And, and you know, we're going to be looking at this in depth come uh, this next week. So, well, friends, are you ready to study then? All right. Well, before we study, we need to really get grounded in the fact that this book, the Bible, is the source book of all truth. This is, you know, today we have everybody, there's an abundance of fact, fact checkers, right? Fact checkers. This is the ultimate fact-checking book. This book is what reveals what's true and what is not true. But tonight we're going to look especially at Revelation chapter 12 and a few other passages to learn um, some answers to some pretty big questions. So, I believe the Bible and the Bible only should be our rule and guide for truth. With that said, feel free to repeat our seminar motto with me. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it's not, I don't need it. All right, my message tonight is called The Anatomy of Evil. Would you please bow your heads and pray with me? My precious Father, tonight as I share, I realize that uh, big questions deserve big answers, but I'm so small. But Lord, I know I serve a big God who has all the answers, and so we, we implore that you would show us from your word this evening truth that would not just set us free from sin, but also set us free from error that has locked us into um, some bad views about you. Help us tonight to understand you better and to uplift Jesus in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. My message is the anatomy of evil. Now, I'm going to begin looking at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12 is a very interesting chapter in the book of Revelation because uh, here John is looking into the future, into the future, into the future, and he comes to Revelation 12 and he pauses and he says, here, let me take you to the past. You know God uses prophets to show the past as well as the future? It's very fascinating. In fact, you know the book of Genesis was written by Moses as God revealed it to him? That's pretty exciting to know. God knows the past as well as the future. That's pretty good because usually history is written by those who are the conquerors. Well, uh, in this world, whether they're right or wrong, well, God happens to be able to supersede what other historians write, and he actually writes and clarifies history. He actually can look back before Adam and Eve. He can go back into heaven to a time when there was war. Now watch this, guys. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9, and there was war where? In heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither were their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Wow, this, and this just is just a glimpse into history about the fall of Lucifer. Now, there are several uh, symbols that have been given here and several symbols that have been uh, revealed here. But I want to explain to you, this is not some uh, Star Wars movie uh, theatrical thing for entertainment's sake. This is a Star Wars in reality. The true history of the true stars. In fact, I, I, I believe a lot of this, this movie stuff, like the Star Wars and all that, that much of it was actually created after the, the true themes of the Bible, and yet often there's so many of these little twists and turns to misrepresent what the Bible actually says. But when you think about war, do you normally think about war happening in heaven? Usually not. But yet that's exactly what the Bible says is happening. So I'm going to invite you to take a journey with me to the center of the universe where there was a battle taking place, a battle for the very throne of God, a battle between good and evil, a battle between God and His angels and Satan and His angels. How did it come to be? How did this, this, this war come to exist? Now actually, thinking about the devil in heaven brings you to a host of other kind of questions like, where did the devil come from? It's a good question, isn't it? How about, how did the dragon, which we know is the devil, we just defined him there in Revelation 12, where, how did the dr dragon and his angels get into heaven? Did God create the devil? Why didn't God just destroy, his, destroy the devil and his angels from the beginning? 
Or maybe the more relevant question that touches all of our lives, why does God allow pain and suffering? Now, I'm going to guess that everybody in here today has experienced some degree of pain and suffering. Everybody in here has gone through some trial that they've stepped back and said, why? Why am I going through this? Why does God allow some loved one to, to go through this prolonged agony and suffering? Why? Why do the innocent suffer? Why does He allow thousands of lives to be snuffed out in some natural disaster? Well, before we answer those questions, I really want to get a baseline here and help you understand something about the character of God. It says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, God is love. Let me say that again. 1 John 3, 4. Say it with me. God is love. That is a foundational principle of the Scriptures. Now understand, because of that, this, this statement can be true. Jeremiah 31.3 says, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. You see, God draws people to Himself using the, the power of love. God does not use force or compulsion. Because God is love. Love is His weapon. Love is his weapon against evil. It's his love is his weapon for good. So let's talk about the problem of evil tonight. And let's ask, if God is so good, why is the world so bad? Grab your Bibles. Does anybody, if anybody needs a Bible, just raise your hand up. Our ushers will get you one. Um, you got, everybody got a Bible? Good. We're going to look here in Matthew chapter 13, a parable that Jesus told. Matthew chapter 13, it's the parable of the sower. Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 24. All right. Go ahead and get there with me. Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 24. Again, we're asking the question, why does God allow evil in this world? Or, 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 or where did all the evil come from? Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. In another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Who, who came and sowed tares? An enemy, okay. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. Now, if you're not aware of what a tear is, a tear is, look, it, when it's starting to sprout, it looks exactly like wheat. But it's not wheat, it's a weed. When you get that, but you don't know it at first. When the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us to then to go and gather them up? But he said, No. Lest while you gather the, up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, what are these symbols in this parable? Ever, Jesus taught in, in parables. Parables were stories that had illustrations to teach lessons. Okay? And not every parable was you know, necessarily a factual story. It's not quite like Aesop's fables where there were kind of some far out weird stuff going on. Sometimes you had some kind of uh, some, some, some interesting stories that Jesus would tell, like the, the, I think about the, uh, the Pearl of Great Price and a few other ones. But this story, nevertheless, has a very important lesson for us. In fact, let's go ahead and see as the disciples came to Jesus and said, Jesus, what, what do you mean? What's all these symbols all about? And Jesus says, you can actually skip on down with me to verse 37. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. So the farmer is the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, right? The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is who? The devil. And the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. You get to, Jesus is pulling together a lot of different symbols into one little story here to help illustrate so a very important lesson. And again, I, I wish I could go through this whole parable and, and elucidate all the different features and aspects of it, but here's what I want you to understand. The two main characters, you have the farmer, you have the enemy. Who is responsible for the tares? Who's responsible for the evil? Was it, was it the farmer? 
No, the farmer sowed what kind of seed? Good seed. It was the enemy who sowed the tares. And so, friends, God is not responsible. Now, I, I tell you, if the insurance comes, if you, something happens, you know, the winds pick up and your tree falls on your car. And you call the insurance company and says, hey, tree fell on my car. They said, sorry, we don't cover acts of God. Have you ever heard about the acts of God? Sorry, acts of God are not covered under your policy. You are out. you got to pay for it out of your own pockets. <laughs> Next time that happens, take them to Matthew 13 and show them that an enemy hath done this. And say this was not an act of God. This was an act of Satan, which my policy does not say is excluded. Therefore, please cover this uh, this damage. I don't know. I don't know that they'll um, fill. Yeah, it wouldn't work. Sounds like you had some run run ins with some uh, some tough adjusters. But I'll say this: you are an adjuster. I was. <laughs> but you know, it had to be a tough job, I'm sure. But you know, guys. Satan is out there causing all kinds of... In fact, we have the story of Job in the Bible to prove it. Here, Job, God called him a righteous, upright person. And what's going on? Satan's out there causing havoc in his life, including natural disasters and tornadoes and, and other things. Now, I'm not saying every single tornado is, is necessarily Satan just messing with your life. You understand? Sometimes these things are put into motion in a sort of bigger way. But I believe Satan, that even the closer we come to the second coming, Satan has more and more liberty over the elements of nature. And he's, he's causing more and more disasters. And here's why that happens, I believe. And I, 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 I'm going to come back to my lesson here. But I'm just going to say this thought here. Sometimes God actively brings judgments. On the day of Sodom and Gomorrah, God brought the fire down. Okay? In the days of Noah, what happened? God brought the flood. Okay, that wasn't Satan doing those things. That said, many times judgments happen upon people, often God's people, for the specific purpose of, you know, they're, they're straying from the right path, they're going their own way, and God wants to correct them, He wants to bring them back, right? So what does God with do? do? He withdraws His special blessing, and it gives room for Satan and his demons to have, have, his, have their way. And, and it, Paul even talked about this, I think it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, that this, this often happens. And so sometimes destruction comes upon this world because God is withdrawing. The more people become faithless, the more people turn their backs on God, the less power He has to save them. I, well, that sounds almost blasphemous. God doesn't have less power. His power is always available. What happens is we, we're less able to receive that power. That's what I was trying to say. We have... Um, God wants to inter intervene in our lives, right? He wants to really protect us. He wants to do amazing things. But friends, we've got to live in such a way that as, we are, as we're surrendering to God's Word, submitting ourselves to, to what the Bible teachings are, get, that gives God the, the, the opening, the freedom to really work in our lives in a miraculous way. Otherwise, like in the story of Nebuchadnezzar coming into Jerusalem and destroying, God made that happen. He had a protection and blessing upon Jerusalem until they started rebelling. He's like, all right. And so God even allowed the holy temple to be destroyed by this pagan king. Again, all, God works all things together for good. But we're, we're not, that's uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. God works all things together for good for them to love God to those who are called according to his purpose. Anyway, more I can say about that. But I just want to, realize, want, want to really clarify this. When something evil happens in this world, some problem, some destruction, some trial, some problem you're going through, some heartache, something that, that's really tragic happens, please don't let your knee-jerk reaction be, God must be mad at me. God must be doing this. God is the reason that this is happening today. Because friends, suffering is not what God's will is. God is not desiring that anybody should suffer. God is not desires that anybody should die. But death and suffering has come into this world as a result of not of what God has done, but what Satan has done. In fact, Jesus clarifies this one day. He was teaching in the synagogue. This is Luke chapter 13 and verse 16. This woman comes in. She's all bowed over like this, and she can't even walk up straight. And Jesus, and they're, and they're like, oh, huh, what, 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 what's Jesus going to do? And Jesus didn't care about their, their, their murmurings and their, their doubts and their wonderings. They were always trying to catch him in a trap. 
So he said, they, they thought, well, you know, a healing on the Sabbath must be a sin, right? So Jesus is certainly not going to heal on the Sabbath because, you know, he doesn't want to sin. But Jesus didn't care because he knew the healing on the Sabbath was actually a good thing, right? So here's what Jesus says to the Pharisees. He says, so ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. Now, who did Jesus ascribe responsibility for her being bound in that condition. He gave the blame on to Satan. Now, does that mean that somehow she, was, she has no responsibility at all, completely absolved? I mean, I don't know. I mean, it could be that, you know, maybe she just had bad posture. And that, you know, that, you know, that just, but the devil often takes advantage of our weaknesses, right? But don't, let, I'm not trying to teach you tonight to just say, well, the devil made me do it. I, let's just blame the devil. I know I robbed that store, but really, the devil made me do it. Send the devil to prison. I'm, I'm, I'm just an innocent bystander here. Not saying that at all. What I'm suggesting is, is this sickness was never God's plan for mankind. And, what, and get this. I, and I hear about this all the time. Tragic stories of, of some, okay, you, you smoke for 50 years. You get lung cancer, right? Who, who's to blame? We made that decision ourselves. Now, I think Satan bears a little bit of responsibility for that, and the fact that he's probably tempted you at the very beginning. He told you, oh, it's not going to hurt you. You're an exception to the rule and all these different things. Right? The devil's out there being the devil. But you made the choice okay, when it came to that. But what about... And that's, that's understandable. Nobody's really, really misunderstanding that one. But what about the, the, you know, the eight-year-old who gets leukemia? What did that eight-year-old ever do? Does she deserve that? Not at all. But sometimes it wasn't the eight-year-old who it did anything. Maybe it's the environment she was born into. Maybe it was something that happened while she was young. Maybe it was something that happened to her parents. We've been learning in the health program about epigenetics and, and various different things about how the decisions your parents make affects the children. right? And sometimes it's not even the decision of the parents. It's sometimes the decision of the grandparents. And it ultimately goes back to their grandparents and their grandparents going all the way back to who? Adam and Eve, our, our ultimate great-grandparents, and the decisions that they made because they chose to sin. You understand what I'm saying? So sometimes the responsibility can go back throughout generations, ultimately landing on Adam and Eve's doorstep, which ultimately lands on Satan's doorstep, which we'll see in here in just a minute. But it all originated with Satan. It all originated with the devil. He's the ultimate one who's responsible. And again, that doesn't absolve my responsibility when I make a bad choice. Because guess what? Jesus also was born of a woman. And he also was tempted of Satan. And did he choose to sin? Not at all. And he offers us the same power to say no to Satan as he had. The same Holy Spirit that he was born with, guess what? If you're born again, you're born again with that same Holy Spirit that gives you the power to say no to sin. No to temptation. So, Luke chapter 16, 13, verse 16, puts the blame on Satan for sickness and ultimately uh, of death. Now, with that said, let's ask the question, where did the devil come from? Now, the word Satan, right? Or Actually, Satan is, 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 a, is a name that he acquired, okay? Well, does anybody remember what Satan's name when it was in heaven? What was his name? You guys know this, okay? Lucifer, Lucifer. And Lucifer, and actually, that more comes from the Latin, lux pharaoh means the light bearer, right? Uh, Halel, I believe it was in Hebrew, but it means the same thing, the light bearer. Ezekiel 28, 12 through 14 gives a little bit of history about Lucifer. Again, this is a book of prophecy that, that paints a picture of the past. It says, you were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect and beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Okay, here's a little side note. Eden wasn't always on earth. There was an Eden in heaven. That's where Lucifer was, right? God planted an Eden on earth. And guess what? When you get to Revelation chapter uh, 21, 22, it actually shows us that Eden is going to be in the New Jerusalem. That's where the tree of life is, right? In Revelation, the tree of life is in the New Jerusalem. The tree of life was there in the garden at the beginning. So here is Eden, in, or Satan in Eden, or Lucifer, I should say, in Eden, the garden of God, every precious stone adorned you. I can't even imagine how beautiful Lucifer was. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You see, God had a special plan for Lucifer. Now, Lucifer is a very interesting name. Does anybody uh, know anybody named Lucifer? No? 
People don't typically name their kids Lucifer. And yet, it was a beautiful name, wasn't it? Originally, it was, an, it was an amazing name. But yet, because he's so, well, because he became who he became, Lucifer now doesn't seem to be so beautiful anymore. But I want you to understand, God created a perfect angelic being. Holy, dazzling in beauty, perfect in all of his ways, right? And he was not just any angel too. He was a leader among the angels. The Bible calls him a covering cherub. When you look at the Ark of the Covenant that God had the, the children of Israel build, he had an angel on one on one side, one on the other side, right? Do you realize that, 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 that Ark of the Covenant that, that had the angel on both sides, do you realize that one of those used to represent Lucifer? Because he was a covering cherub. Because that, that Ark of the Covenant represented the throne of God in heaven. We'll look at that again this weekend. So did God create the devil? Now, that's kind of a trick question. I didn't hear any answers out there. Did God create a devil? I believe the answer is no. But didn't God create everything? Yeah, everything he created was good. Everything God created is good. So if God didn't create the devil, where did he come from? Well, I'll put it like this. God created Lucifer who became the devil. Now, that may seem like semantics to you, but I think it's very important to understand the difference. Look at what happened, Isaiah 14, 13 and 14. It's easy to remember. If you want to go to the history of Lucifer, you can look in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, Revelation 12. Those are the three main passages that gives you more of a detailed biography uh, and origin of Lucifer. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. You see, Lucifer had an I problem. Lucifer was full of self. He, didn't all, he wasn't always that way, but it came to the place to where he desired the very throne of God. And while he was yet in heaven, this, before this war even broke out, the, the very origins of this war, somehow Lucifer began to despise God, despise his ways, and he eventually rejected God's authority, God's kingdom. He rejected God's law. He wanted to be his own God. He wanted to sit on the throne of God. He wanted to place his opinion above the God's sovereignty. When I was in the church of Satan... We believed that we were our own gods. That, that's kind of one of the pivotal teachings of Satanism is that you individually are a god. Well, that makes a lot of sense because that was the devil's first lie. I mean, he even told Adam that in the Garden of Eden. God will know the day you eat this, you become like him, becoming gods. Satan has tempted people with becoming a god. Oh, friends, don't buy that lie. That's what Satan did when he was in heaven until the point came where he was able to deceive a third of the angels and they were cast down to this earth. All of them. So why doesn't God just destroy the devil and his angels? That's a pretty good question. And I submit to you that God created the angels with the same thing He created you and I with and that's something called free will or the freedom of choice. And He knew that. I mean, think about it. God made the angels knowing that some, some, one of them at some time and some place would could possibly choose to go a different direction, to say no to God. Now, why would create a being? Why would God create a being like Lucifer with the capacity to rebel? Well, I think the answer is actually pretty simple. See, God wanted angels to choose to serve Him out of love, not out of force. See, if there's no ability to make a wrong choice, then there's no true freedom of choice. It all. Does that make sense to you? I'm going to say this one more time. If there's no ability to make a wrong choice, there's no true freedom of choice at all. Now, I'm going to share with you about uh, a robot friend named Robbie. Uh, let's just make up a hypothetical scenario. Let's say down the line, you know, 50 years, uh, robots become a pretty uh, you know, ubiquitous thing. Everybody can, can buy them, these little house robots that and, and, you know, now that you can buy them right now, even though it would be like little, little dogs, you know, like little cats, little dinosaurs, little, little toy toys. But eventually the time's going to come, I'm sure, but they're going to make little kid robots. And so for a family, perhaps, who uh, maybe didn't have kids, they got a little older, they, they, they decided, you know what, I'm going to adopt one of these robots. And so let's just say they go to the robot store and they bring home this robot and they named him Robbie. 
And uh, Robbie, they took him out of the box. They pushed a few buttons. They programmed him just the way they were told to program him. They pushed the start button, and out of the box, Robbie was alive. And so what happened was um, they said, you know, they started giving instructions as, as you would any, uh, any kid. They said, okay, Robbie, uh, you know, it's, uh, you got home. It's actually now supper time, uh, so let's go to supper. Let's see if we can get it playing here. You hear that? Yes, Papa. There you go. Yes, Papa. You got that? Yes, Papa. Oh, he's very, he's kind of in a loop now. Let's try again. Yes, Papa. I don't even know how to stop him now. Yes, okay. Papa. All right, we'll have to reprogram him here for just a second. So, okay, so then, you know, supper's over and it's time to brush your teeth, Robbie. So, uh, let's see if we can get uh, Robbie to brush his teeth here. Let's see. Wow. Let's see here. Yes, Papa. There you go. So Robbie's finally brushing his teeth. And, and uh, you know, then you finally, the next day comes around and, and the mom says, hey, Robbie, come help me in, in the garden. Yes, Papa. All right, very nice. And, and it's, you know, it's time once again to go to bed. Yes, Papa. Day after day, this happens time and time again where you have uh, this uh, obedient Robbie. Right, doing exactly what he's told. Now, parents, wouldn't it be nice to have your children say, do exactly as you tell them to do everything? Um, and then so after, after a while, you know, you kind of develop this connection with this robot. And so you say, you know, Robbie, I really love you. And so Robbie, you know, responds back and says, I love you, Papa. I love you, Papa. You guys hear that? Robbie loving Papa. You hear that? Well, I love you too. Love you, Papa. Sorry, not, not getting that quite on the microphone there. But, uh, you know, of course, years and years go by. Time eventually comes where, I really love you, Papa. you know, the, the voice kind of gets rough after a while. You know, friends, did God create robots? He didn't. Why not? Why he could have created he, he, God has the power to make anything he wants, right? Why did he not create beings with the with the incapacity to disobey? To put it differently, why didn't God make beings to always do what he said to do? Without question, without thought, just do it. Because friends, if you how do I put this? If you program somebody to love you, it's not love. If you force somebody to love you, it's not love. In fact, I'll put it like this. If I program a machine to love me, who's actually loving me? I'm loving me. And there's a, no, there's a word for that. It's selfishness. Does God have any selfishness? No, we started off tonight by looking at 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Sorry, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. And it says, God is love. So if I was to, you know, put a chip behind this woman's ear, Jenny, my wife, right? And I, and I the, the forced her to walk down the aisle, stand here and say, I do and kiss me, right? If I, if I did a chip to make all that happen, that's not love. She can say, I love you, but friends that, you know, forced love, there's a word for that in the criminal world. It's called rape. And God does not even believe in this, this idea of, of forced love. And so what does God do? He makes beings with the ability to hate. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? But the reality is you, to create a being any other way would basically be creating a robot with a forced love. I mean, even a dog today that, that, that you know, has the ability to, to love more than a robot could. Maybe it's not the same kind of love that a person could give you, but it's more than a robot. Love must be chosen. So God gave the angels freedom of choice. Now, Ezekiel 28, 15 emphasizes that he was perfect in the day, so from the days he was created. So there was really no excuse for Satan to choose or Lucifer to choose another path. There was really no excuse for, for Lucifer to think that somehow God wasn't as great or wonderful as he was. It wasn't, it wasn't like in God's angel-making machine, right? There was some kind of defect that day. And, 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 oops, didn't mean to make that one. Hopefully it turns out okay. 
That's not what God did. It, Lucifer was perfect in all of his ways. He didn't have, you know, um, uh, you know, demons out there to tempt him. No, it was a perfect, beautiful universe. So what did cause Lucifer to rebel? Well, I don't have all the answers, but the Bible gives us a little bit of insight. Watch this, friends. Ezekiel 28, 17, your heart was lifted up because of what? Your beauty. You got to watch out, pretty people. I'm telling you right now, if you're beautiful, you've got to be careful. The more beautiful you are, the more pride you're tempted to have. Uh-huh. All you, all you ladies in here, you're like, yeah, I know. It's been a tough life. But I'll say this. I'll say this. Satan was the most beautiful of them all. But, you know, the reality is he didn't even know it. But it says he corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. So someday, I, I'm only imagining this here with my, with my imagination, but I can imagine one day Lucifer, he's walking there in the, in the Garden of Eden next to the River of Life, and he's looking down into the River of Life, and he just happens to notice his reflection. And he looks down and says, whoa, well, there's a handsome devil. And that's how it all started. You got that, didn't you? All right. So I, I don't know. I don't know if that's how it all started, but somewhere along the way, in, in, a, in a really, in a real way, he turned his eyes off of Jesus and onto himself. He, he got his eyes off of, of, of the glory of God and trying to lift up and glorify God to somehow thinking, you know what? I don't need God. So he convinced himself of a lie to the point that we began to share that lie and deceiving others. It all started with pride that started in his heart as he began to look inward. It's so dangerous to look inside. Look outside. Look at others. Be selfless, not selfish. Pride began to grow until it turned into selfishness. Selfishness would naturally turn into jealousy. Jealousy, if it's not arrested, it's going to turn into envy. Envy held on to becomes hatred. Hatred is naturally going to become rebellion. Rebellion will become revolution. And in this case, this revolution turns into all-out war in heaven. And of course, this war would lead to death. The eternal death of many, the physical death of many as well. So how did this earth get involved in this great, co great conflict between good and evil, this, this, this cosmic uh, war, this battle? How did this earth get in involved? Well, somehow, as Satan was cast out to this earth, and I don't know the exact sequence, and I know there's some speculation about it, but I know that the Bible says he was cast out to this earth, okay? And Jesus said in Luke 10, 18, I, and he said to them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Of course, Jesus was one of the ones responsible, was what was the one responsible for casting him out of heaven to this earth. You understand? And, uh, and so who was on this planet? Well, God had just made this world. He had just created the, this, this beautiful earth. Six days of creation. He put there in the garden this man and this woman, Adam and Eve. And he said it was good. It was very good. All of it. But then... There was also another tree in the midst of that garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And Satan requested the ability to go and tempt Adam and Eve. But God said, no. I'm not going to let you go and tempt them, but I will allow you to go to the tree and stay at the tree. Because God had warned them to stay away from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so Lucifer was allowed to go to the tree. But again, what if... I can imagine Satan saying something to the effect of, God, if you don't let me tempt them, it's because you know my way is better. You see, at this point, it's almost like God was on trial. And when God is on trial here, you know, we know Jesus was on trial. Remember that? Was Jesus innocent or guilty? He was innocent, but you had all these false accusers, right? Did he, did he object? Did he fight? Did he wrestle his way out of trial? No, no, no. He let it go to trial. He let the world see, and as the story is told throughout history, we can all look back and see that it was a monkey trial at best, right? That obviously Jesus was innocent. We know that now looking back, seeing the big picture. But in the moment, everybody was hollering, crucify him, crucify him. And in the same way, Satan was accusing the Father of being unfair. Satan was accusing God's government of being corrupt. And Satan says, I've got a better way. I've got a better government. And God's like, no, you don't. And so this was a way that Satan had an opportunity to prove it. But it only if, if, if Adam and Eve would go and fall into sin. And so God, a loving God, gave Adam and Eve also the same freedom to choose. God permitted Satan to come to the garden 
God limited Satan to that one tree. He warned Adam and Eve to stay away from that tree. In fact, I would say this. God did everything he could to keep Adam and Eve away from Satan. But they wouldn't listen. And you know the history since that time. So I don't have to get into the entire story of that. But I want to emphasize, friends, that God cannot force love. So He would not force Adam and Eve to, to be blind to that tree or to, to, you know, when they come up, there's like a big force field all around that tree. You can't get through to that tree. No, no. God would not do that. There had to be the freedom to choose. This is powerful because, I mean, think about it. When God made Adam and Eve, did He know that there was the potential that they could sin? God's God. Of course He knew. But let me ask you this. Parents, well, I guess most of you in here have had kids. If not, you may have kids one day. Did you get a written guarantee that your kids would always love you? Mm. Did you did, did you get I mean wh what kind of insanity is it that parents would have a baby will I, mean, I I get it. You know what? Sometimes you just you wasn't planning on it. It just happened. Okay. But for the rest of you who said, "You know what? Let's have a baby." Let me tell you. Is it a little bit insane? To think, I'm going to bring a child into this world and I know they're going to love me for the rest of my life. They're going to take care of me when I get old. Did you have that guarantee? None of you did. But why would you do it? Why would you have a kid knowing that it was just a huge chance that they would not? That, they, that one day that child could look you in the face and say the dreadful words, I hate you. Why would you do it? Why would you have a kid knowing that risk? What was it? Out of love. You see, God put into every single one of you a desire to be loved and a desire to give love. Because that is who God is. God desires to be loved and God, desire, God uh, wants to give love. In fact, that's how I know there, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a trinity. That there's a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I know that's the case because eternally there's always been a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who's loved each, each other. right? Unselfishly loving one another. All right, that's a different subject. But the point is, is that because God is love, He wants us to have that same character trait. He wants us to love one another. And so when we have a child, we're, yes, we, yes we, want, we want a child to love. But we also want that child to love us. Because that's what makes a family. That love going in that circle, right? And so we, we know that child's got free will. And we're going to do the best, our, best we can. And by the way, let me tell you something. For any parent who has a straying child, a child who's, who's left the path. You know, he, he, he's, he, he or she has gone the way of the world, and, and you just ache in your heart for them. I'm going to tell you something. I'll give you a little bit of comfort here. God was a perfect parent to Adam and Eve, and they still chose the wrong path, okay? So don't beat yourselves up too bad. Could you have done things better? Sure, we've all could have done things better, right? God couldn't say that. He did everything right. Now, the good news is, is that Adam and Eve's story was not hopeless, and neither are any of your children, right? God has a plan, and He can save any of them. So, praise God for free, free will. But that free will also led to death, right? It led, because, you know, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And the planet became separated from God, and that's what brought heartache into this world. That's what brought tears into this world. Pain. And suffering is because of choice, the freedom of choice to do what God said we shouldn't do. So what would God do? Would God destroy this rebel planet? Would he just say, oh, I gave you a chance. Wash my hands of you. Goodbye. That's not what he did because of what we read earlier, right? I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. God is love. So what did he do? He put into a plan of action. We can read about it in chapter 5, verse 8 of the book of Romans. Romans 5, verse 8. I'm going to turn it real quick and read it for you. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, it says here, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, he didn't wait for us to get our act together before sending his son to die for us. Jesus came while we were yet enemies of God. Jesus came and gave his life for you and me to buy us back, from, to ransom us back from Satan's tyranny. In fact, I love the early promise that was given by the angel. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. God isn't just content to save us from the past, 
penalty of sin. God wants to save us from the present power of sin. And not more, just that, He also wants to save us from the future presence of sin. And by God's grace, friends, we will be in a world that's made new sometime here in, here in the near future. John 3.16, you know what it says, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, finish it with me, that whoever believes on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus made a way of escape so that we could all have everlasting life. Let's go back to that question about why does God allow Satan the power to tempt and hurt? And he, we know he's responsible for all uh, sin and suffering. But the Bible says, it actually gives us some good news, that God is one day going to punish the devil. In fact, you can read about it in Matthew chapter 25. He's going to cast the devil into the lake of fire. In fact, it says it's prepared for the devil and his angels. When hellfire burns, Satan's going to be burning. That's, that's good news for you and me because throughout eternity, you're not going to have the devil tempting you. Is that, is that clear? That's good news, okay? I have a whole message we're talking about the lake of fire in the future, but it's going to feature Satan as the first and greatest to suffer there. But there's another question we need to answer. Why didn't God just destroy his angels and the devil, the, the satanic angels and the, and the devil from the beginning? Well, I'm just going to, I'm going to break down just a little quick scenario here to help understand, um, uh, this, this is kind of a parable of my own, okay? You, know, you guys like parables? So in this parable, I want you to imagine that uh, there was a king, and he was a good king, a righteous king he, over his whole realm. And uh, as, as good as he was, uh, he had a prime minister who um, became discontent. And he began to want what the king had. He appreciated that the king had a bigger bed than he had. He had a bigger, uh, you know, uh, courtyard than he had. He, he, he just, he wanted what the king had. And so he devised a plan. And he went out and started telling the subjects of the kingdom that, that the king was selfish. That the king uh, was, was, was uh, he was actually greedy. That the king was actually holding out. He had something that, that nobody else could have. He was unfair. And that if he was in charge, he would do a better job, right? Well, of course, it wasn't long before the king caught wind of the prime minister's stories that he was telling. So what did the prime minister do? Or sorry, what did the king do? Well, what would you do if you were the king? And you were a good king. You weren't any of these things that he claimed. You know, you want, maybe, and maybe the, let's say the prime minister was around saying you were embezzling money and all kinds of stuff, but you weren't guilty of any of those stuff. What would you do to stop the lie? What would you do for the truth to come out? Well, I'll tell you what most people, or it's not maybe say most people, some people would do is they would actually, get this now, they would actually have the prime minister killed. They'd have a public execution. You lie about the king, off with his head. Now the king, remember, the king's a good king. The king's a fair king. The king's a just king. He's not guilty of any of those things. So he's just trying to protect his name. So what does he do? He kills the prime minister to let everybody know you don't lie about the king. Would that solve the problem of people doubting the king? No. So killing the prime minister and any of his followers would not solve the problem. So a good king, in this scenario, in this parable, what a king should do is let it go to trial. The king goes on trial. He says basically, okay, let's open up the books and let's see what I got. Let's, let's put out the video cameras and let's examine what the video cameras say. Let's put it all out for everybody to see. Transparency is the name of the game. And they let the accuser be cross-examined. Let's examine what he thinks he can run a better kingdom. Let's see what he's done with, the, with this new authority that he thinks he has. And do you know what happens? As everybody examines the evidence, and they see what the false accuser says and what the king says, everything's laid out there. At the end of the day, the answer's had. And guess what? Then the people... We'll have justice. And yes, the, the prime minister will probably lose his head. But everybody is going to serve the king now out of a loyalty and of, of love. But if, he, but if the king had killed, remember, if the king had just killed the prime minister at the very beginning, you know what, they probably would still be loyal. But the reason they would be loyal is because they were scared. Oh, sh sh you better not talk about the king. You're going to lose your head too. Don't even doubt it or you're going to, you know, the king did not want to rule his kingdom with doubt and suspicion and fear. He wanted to rule his kingdom with love. And that's why, my friends, God 
is allowing this to play out. That's why the God did not kill the devil and his angels from the beginning. Didn't do it. He is allowed to play it out. And, and the, the time's going to come when the world's going to see. In fact, I would say at the cross, the world and the universe, all the other beings that God's created, was able to see Satan's plan for what it was. But God's still looking for a people to represent him who will be witnesses in God's favor to say, you know what, God is fair. God is just. The God, God isn't asking unrighteously. God isn't saying to obey me for nothing. And you and I have the privilege of representing God. You, you get the power of that? This last generation of people who are alive when Jesus comes back, are in the, in the, I'm talking about the, the worst generation of Earth's history where, where we've become the most corrupted genetically, morally, yet God's going to have a people that's going to shine like bright lights in these last days. And what a witness and what a testimony against Satan in the day of judgment. So friends, I'm so thankful that God has given us answers in His Word. But I still want to just cover, just as I, as I, as I, I'm a, before I close that, I want to share just a few comforting thoughts. Why does God allow sorrow and suffering? Remember, God doesn't necessarily cause it, but He allows it. I'm going to share with you four things that God uses or allows to happen in our lives um, and the reasons why, okay? So, first of all, God allows us to go through trials and sorrow and tr suffering because uh, it would reveal our character. Um, I have an illustration here. Imagine two jars of honey. Both of them are labeled honey, but it just so happens one of them is actually full of vinegar and not honey. How do you know what's in it? How do you know what's in the jar? Well, what if I knocked them both off the, the counter and they cracked open, right? What's in automatically comes out. <laughs> the honey will come out of the honey jar. Now, even though the other one's labeled honey, if vinegar's in it, vinegar's going to come out. Does that make sense? And so what happens here? You've got Jesus who is beat and bruised and smacked and spit upon, his beard plucked out, they, they, they crucified him, and, and what came out? Honey. Honey. Right? Because what? Because he was full of honey. What's in you is going to come out. When you're broken, when you're bruised, when you get toppled over, when you get when you fall, or in, in the sense of uh you know, getting shaken up some, go through a trial, what's in you is going to come out. And if what comes out of you is vinegar, you know what that means? It doesn't mean you're a hopeless case. What it means is, even if you think there's honey inside, but vinegar comes out, it means you need to go back to the drawing board, right? It means you realize, oh, you know what? <laughs> I guess I wasn't uh, as mature as I thought I was in that area. I need to grow in that area. So God allows us to go through trials to reveal what's inside of us. Does that make sense? A lot of people out there think they're Christians. They go through a trial and it reveals they're not. And that doesn't necessarily mean you're not a Christian if you go through a trial, right? Maybe, you're, maybe you are a Christian, but God wants you to help refine you in the area of, of we talked about pride, maybe in the area of, of, um, uh, of kindness, your anger, right? He wants to help you to mature in those areas. God also lets us go through trials to purify us. Very similar. It looks like 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7 says that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation or the appearing of Jesus Christ. And so you put the gold into the furnace to purify the gold, right? God will allow us to go through the fire of affliction to purify us. Now, again, theoretically, this sounds really good. But when we're in the fire, we don't like it. <laughs> None of us like it, but if you could, by God's grace, if you can just think in the, in the moment, this is a trial designed to help me to grow and become a better Christian. God can do that. He will purify you like gold. And by the way, the good news is, if you're going through a trial, that means God considers you valuable. You're gold in His eyes. And He's just trying to purify you and make you more pure gold. Amen? He's, he's getting you ready for this city right here. He wants you to be gold so you can walk on the streets of gold in the city of gold. Another reason that we go through trials is to strengthen in our faith and our experience. Um, think about those trees way up on the mountains. The ones that stand tall and strong amidst all the worst kinds of weather. Why? Because they've learned to endure through the hard times. We are getting ready to go through a hard trial in this earth's history. God will let us go through the small trials to prepare you for the big ones. You know, Daniel chapter 2, or sorry, Daniel chapter 1, Daniel and his friends went through a trial of faith. 
They were told, you better eat the king's meat. You better drink the wine. Sorry, we can't do it. Our God says not to. If you don't do it, you're going to die. I may end up dying. Well, we're going to do what's right. And they stood tall. And because they stood tall there, listen, in Daniel chapter 3, whenever the, the three Hebrews were there, they were told to bow down before the image in this, this worship test. Because they stood tall in Daniel 1, they were able to stand tall in Daniel 3. Does it make sense? You go through the smaller trials. God will give you faith to strengthen you for the bigger trials to come. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. So next time you go through a trial, I don't know what it's going to be. Maybe the doctor's going to come and tell you, you know, you have a very serious illness. What does he say to do? Count it all. Joy. Are you going to do that? The doctor's going to say, um, I'm telling you, but the prognosis is not good. Praise the Lord. You get a phone call saying somebody you very much care about it is deathly ill. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not trying to be... Uh, funny about that. I'm just suggesting that, look, there's a greater joy because when you go through these things, it is going to strengthen you. By the way, it's always easier after the fact, looking back to count it joy than it is in the moment. But if we have the faith to say, you know what, if God brings us to it, if God brings us to it, he'll bring us through it. Like the Hebrews, right? In the, in, in the fiery furnace. Jesus was with them in the fire. Isn't today the fourth? May the fourth be with you, right? The fourth man in the fire. He was there. And so he'll be with us through the fiery trials as well. And finally here, we sometimes suffer because God allows us freedom to choose. Sometimes the suffering is because of the choices we've made. Now, not, this isn't the case in every case, but this is often the case as well. Galatians chapter 6, and verse 7. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. I talked about smoking earlier. And people, you know, I mean, think about it. Tobacco kills more than 8 million people every year. 7 million of those Deaths are, are, are specifically from smoking cigarettes. 1.2 are just from like secondhand smoke. Can you, can you imagine that? So imagine somebody gets cancer and they're, and they're in, the, in their uh, hospital bed and they're uh, shaking their fist at God. God, why did you let this happen to me? God simply lets us reap what we sow. That doesn't mean you can't be saved. It doesn't mean that God can't work with you. It doesn't mean that, that God won't even heal you. I will say this. I have a hard time praying for somebody who's just going to go back and do the same thing again. Now, I may pray for you. It, may not, it just may not be a prayer of healing. Maybe asking God to give you the power of repentance and then bring the healing, right? But let's not tempt God. God's not mocked, he says. Whatever man sows, that shall he also reap. But that doesn't mean that everybody laying in the hospital bed has done something wrong. Because let me tell you something. There are, sometimes the innocent suffers. Isn't that true? I could think of somebody who's innocent that suffered. You got it. Jesus. He suffered. He didn't deserve a thing he got. So if there's anybody who knows what it's like for the innocent to suffer, Jesus understands. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, that the just suffered for the unjust. So what we look, when we look at the cross, friends, we can see there the greatest victory in this great controversy between good and evil. You see, because Jesus got the victory on the cross, He gives you and me the freedom of choice. Think about it. If Jesus would have failed, none of us could have chose heaven. If Jesus would have failed in His mission, none of us would have had the, the opportunity of everlasting life. We would have all been doomed to destruction, eternal destruction. But because Jesus got the victory at the cross, he gives us a choice. And oh, to have that choice and to not make the choice to follow Jesus is a tragic choice. Jesus gave his life to buy back that freedom of choice. And I pray that all of us would do that very thing. So here's a little review here. We go through trials and suffering to reveal our character, to purify us, to strengthen our faith and experience, to give us freedom. And then I'm sure there's other things as well. But let God have his perfect work in you. When you're going through these hard times, friends, try to see through the trial, through the struggling, and see what God wants to do through you with that, okay? What, what, what does He want to bring you to? Ask God, Lord, where do you want me to grow? I was a pretty young Christian. Somebody said, no, never pray for patience. If you pray for patience, God will give you children. 
I tell you what, children are a gift from God, but God has given me my children to refine my own character. I thought I would be a great dad, and all of a sudden I'm realizing, whoa, I've got, I've got light years to grow. And then we just said, oh, we have one kid, and we're saying, Lord, should we have another one? And they said, well, if you have just one kid, there's a tendency to, for that kid to be selfish, right? And uh, we didn't think much long, but before we found out we, had, we were pregnant with a second one, we're like, well, huh? Problem solved for us. But guess what? You have two kids and they're still selfish. <laughs> Doesn't solve the problem. These, these things in our life happen to, to, to grow us, friends. Now, has sin caused God any sorrow or suffering? Of course, I just emphasized that, but just a few words to give you some encouragement. But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine, God says, when thou pass through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers they shall not overflow thee, when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. God says, when you go through those trials, I'll be with you. Amen? So what is it that you've gone through? What is the trials that you've been experiencing lately? Is, is there anything that you've gone through that you've just felt like, I don't know if I can handle it anymore? Remember, friends, when we're suffering, where is God? When we're going through the trials, where is God? He's with us, right? I'm going to close tonight with a story that you guys know pretty well. The footprints in the sand. Two, a man stands at the end of his life looking back over the sands of time. As he's looking back over the sands of time, he notices two sets of footprints. And there's the Lord. And of course, the Lord's standing aside. He says, Lord, look, look here. There's the two sets of footprints in the sand. And he's very happy about that as he sees those two sets of footprints. But as he looks a little bit closer over the sands of time, he realizes that in the darkest time of history, of his life, there was only one set of footprints. And his heart grew heavy. He looked up at the Lord. He said, Lord, why is it during the hardest times of my life and the biggest trials, why, where were you? Where were you? And so the Lord looks down at the man. He says, son, during the hardest times of your life, when you only saw one set of footprints in the sand, it wasn't that I abandoned you, friend. It was you that I was carrying. Those were my footprints that you saw. Friends, I want you to know tonight that God cares about every single one of you. I don't care if you're lonely. I don't care if you're, uh, 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 you, you feel like you're going through an affliction and a trial, the hardest time of your life. God promises He'll be with you. Call out to Him in the day of trial. Friends, He will be with you. He will carry you through it, whether it's a cancer diagnosis, whether it's uh, a financial struggle, and you're just, or maybe a job loss, or whatever it is you're going through, God says, I'll be with you through that trial. Let Him use that trial to grow you. Let Him use that trial to draw you closer to Himself. Some of the strongest Christians I know, they'll, they'll tell you, it's because I went through this trial, this hardship in my life. That's why I'm so close to Jesus today. That's good news. And I just want to invite you, if anybody here tonight senses maybe a word, maybe, maybe a thought of encouragement, the fact that, yes, God gives us free will, but He gives us the strength to make the best choices in life, and that one day God will deal with the devil. Justice will happen. God doesn't want any of us to suffer, and one day there will be no more suffering. That's the promise of God's Word. But if anybody in here maybe finds a, a sense of relief in that, or maybe a sense of encouragement in that, would you just stand to your feet to say, Thank you, Jesus, that we can, we can have hope. We can have encouragement. We can know that as hard as it gets, God is good. You know, and before we close tonight, I just want to make an opportunity. Perhaps there's somebody here tonight that just needs special prayer. Somebody who maybe is going through something especially hard. Maybe your faith is the size of a mustard seed tonight, and you're, and you're reaching, you're grasping, you're saying, I want more encouragement. I want more help from God. And so if there's anybody here tonight that really senses a need for special prayer, Phil, I want to invite you just to come on to the front. I'll come down and I'll have a special prayer with you. Is there anybody here tonight that would feel a need for special prayer for anything? Come on forward. Amen. Okay. 
Anybody else would like to come for? Come on up here. Amen. Amen. Crowd in as close as you're comfortable with. Amen. Amen. You're all right. Come on forward. Amen. Praise the Lord. Anybody else need special prayer this evening? Thank you. Come on, Pastor Jose is going to pray with us. Amen. Anybody else need special prayer tonight? That doesn't mean if you're back that we're not going to pray for you. We're going to pray for you too. But tonight, if there's anything that you're really just feeling a burden, asking God for special help about, you don't have to reveal the, the details to me. I'm not asking you to do that. But, but I want you to know that you're cared about. And God cares about you. Do that. You can feel free to put your hand on somebody's shoulder next to you if you're comfortable with that. Shake it if you're not. But I'm going to pray for you guys. Father in heaven, keep coming up if, you're, if you need to come. Father in heaven, You've seen the faith of those who've stepped forward to say, God, they need something special from your hand. And I don't know what it is. Lord, is it deliverance they need? Is it some spiritual battle they're fighting? Some victory over sin they desire? God, some sickness that they, they're trying to beat. Some tragedy they're trying to or discouragement or depression they're fighting. God, whatever it is in their life, please draw close to them now. L throw your loving arms around them, your arms of, of comfort. And strengthen them, Lord. Build them up. Show them that there's hope. Show them that there's strength. Lord, show them that in You, they can do all things. All things are possible. Father, we've, they've come forward to say by faith that You have the answers. And so, Lord, we seek Your face tonight for those answers. And I thank You for the promises You've given us that You are a God of love. And that you draw us with the cords of love. And Lord, for those that have stood up to say, yes, they've been encouraged tonight, Lord, let them not leave without a blessing as well. Thank you for each and every one of them, Lord. Keep them close to your side. Remind them daily of your love for them and your plan for their lives. Lord, we know your son is coming soon. We want to be ready. Lord, and we see these empty seats out here in the in the auditorium, and we want them to be filled. Please, Father, draw people to these meetings to hear answers that will help them be ready. Oh, God in heaven, we commit ourselves again to you tonight afresh. Please take our hearts. Make them yours. We love you so much. In Jesus' holy name, amen. 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 God bless you guys. You have a good night. God bless you. Thank you for coming up, guys. And for all of you here,